right. Yep, good to go. All right. Good morning, everybody. This is the time and place set for the virtual zoning board of adjustment for the city of Pittsburgh hearings on August 13th, 2020. Our first case of the morning is zone case 112 of 2020 for 5005 Lytle Street. Do we have an applicant for that hearing? Yes, the applicant is Joe Hackett. Okay. Can we get Mr. Hackett on? Make sure he's not muted. There we go. Mr. Hackett, good morning. Um, good morning. Do you anticipate that um, anybody else will be joining you with respect to this application this morning? I believe so, yes. Uh, the client, uh, the, the, the owner of the property, uh, David Cayley from the Progress Fund, and his attorney, uh, Tom Abe. Okay. I see both of them. All right, let's let them on. So Tom was going to start the presentation, and then I'll do All the right. more technical. You're the one who uh, was identified as the applicant, so we know to start with you. Okay. There's Mr. Ayub. Good morning, everybody. And we have Mr. Kaylee as well. Yes, I'm here. All right. I'm going to ask you all to um, swear in first, and then um, Daniel will read in the, the case. So first, do each of you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I, I do. do. Thank you. Daniel, you're on. This is case 112 of 2020 for 5005 Lytle Street. The applications for the renovation of an existing building to a brewery with accessory restaurant use, requesting a special exception from 916.09, .09, commercial parking lo located in a residential district, and a special exception from 914.07.g.2 for offsite parking. All right, Mr. Ayub, I understand you're gonna start? I will, yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to be before you for the first time on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> Uh, obviously, uh, I'm familiar to you, but not in this form. Uh, this is an interesting project. Uh, this is the former Hazelwood Brewery in the city of Pittsburgh neighborhood of Hazelwood. Uh, my client, the Progress Fund, is a Pennsylvania nonprofit uh, community development financial institution, and it's seeking to redevelop this property and use it as a catalyst to help redevelop the neighborhood. Uh, my client, the Progress Fund, is working in conjunction with the city of Pittsburgh, uh, who acquired the property and then ultimately conveyed it, most of it, that is part of this assemblage, uh, to my client. Uh, the use uh, is allowed by right and there has been painstaking effort by the design team and my clients to comply with all aspects of the zoning code. And the only two items that are not fully compliant as of right are the two special exceptions that are being sought today. And when you see those, hopefully you'll understand uh, the, the minimus nature uh, of the requests and how they really fit within, in a very logical planning sense, the overall development and how they will have minimal, if any, impact to the community. Mr. Uh, Abe, did I understand you to say that the, the property had previously been used for Pittsburgh Brewing? And now uh, it's the request is to build a brewery. Yeah, it's a, it was the former Hazelwood Brewery. Uh, and it has some historical significance now, what my client seeks to do, uh, it's almost like a brewery catalyst. Uh, the use will have three separate uh, smaller brewery segments, uh, and each brewer will be able to manufacture, package, store, sell, and distribute their beer in this historical brewery building. Uh, they'll each have like a separate production area, a separate tap room, uh, and then as part of it, each will have a separate gift shop and tasting counter. 
And then all three of the breweries will share a food counter. It's a food service. Now, just a point of clarification, I know as it was written up and uh, as it was described by Daniel earlier that said a restaurant, there is not a restaurant element to it. There will be no wait staff. There'll be no food service. There's going to be a food counter and uh, it's a permitted accessory use uh, under the zoning code, uh, not a separate and distinct use uh, under zoning uh, food service when it services employees and visitors is allowed as an accessory use. Okay, it won't well, be the, it, uh, not to interrupt you, but the, uh, we will focus on the um, special exceptions that you've requested. And so Good. I guess it, the, what we need to understand is um, where the proposed parking would be in relation to the R zone district and where um, parking is proposed. I guess one of the questions um, associated with the uh, parking requirement is, is it the same, is it the offsite parking for which you're seeking the special exception for um, the uh, waiver of the residential compatibility or is there some on-site parking and some off-site parking? I'll give you a brief description and I'll turn it over to Joe Hackett and he'll give you, we have a presentation package that will clearly reflect uh, your uh, what okay. we're doing and your questions. But the on-site element is a side yard lot uh, which is the only, it's about 23,000 square feet, 24,000 square feet of property, 3,000 of which is located in the residential neighborhood and uh, it's immediately adjacent. It's part of the consolidated lots. Uh, it's three parking spaces next to the building to be used for employees only. So it'll have minimal in and out. Uh, the immediate adjacent property owner, I understand is to be participating today, a Chuck Christian, and he is, has no objection, is in, is in support of what's being done. Uh, the off-site parking uh, is about 20 feet away and, in fact, uh, adjacent to another property owned by the Progress Fund, which is adjacent to the subject property. Uh, so the plans will more fully reflect that. But the residential element is part of the subject property and is not the off-site, to answer your question. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'll let Mr. Hackett provide to you the uh, plans uh, and then you'll see it and then maybe I'll do a quick little wrap up and it's gonna take very long. Very good, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Hackett, go for it. Good morning. Uh, the slide that you see up on the screen is an, an aerial shot of the neighborhood. Um, the little pin that's, that's shown is uh, the, the uh, brewery building in, in question, 5007 Lytle Street. Um, to, the, to the page south is all residential, to the right is residential. Surrounding uh, the brewery on the, on the left side and the right side is a general industrial zoning district. If you flip to the next slide, please. Daniel does that. Yeah, there we go. sorry. All right, not to worry. So this is this is a view of the building from Lytle Street. As Mr. Abe said, there's there's sort of three bays to the building now. Um, it was built in 1905 as a brewery. We're going to bring it back as a brewery, ex except it'll have three separate brewers. Each one will have one of these garage doors, and the the sort of companion space on the on the second and third floors. So this is what it looks like if you're standing on Lytle Street. Uh, next slide, please. This is the lot to the right. This was a residential lot. This is in the R1A VH zoning district. Um, it has been consolidated and added to uh, the brewery property. So it's residential house to the right and then uh, the brewery to the left. Next slide. This is the other parcel in question, which is along Tecumseh Street, which is separate from the brewery property. Um, that's Tecumseh Street in front where that stuff is piled is actually the lot. That White House is not part of the project. The building in the background is actually owned by the Progress Fund. So this lot where the parking is, is adjacent to that building, which is then adjacent to the subject property. 
Next slide. So all the all the lines, everything that's outlined in red is owned by the Progress Fund. So you can see there's a sort of rectangular property that, that surrounds the brewery building. There's the, the building to page north, and there's the smaller separate lot, which is going to be parking. The uh, blue lines represent the uh, different zoning districts. So the brewery building, the property to the to page north and left is all in the GI district. Um, a residential to the right and to the south, the R1A. So actually our, this property that was purchased just to the right of the building, you can see is it's part of the subject property, but spans the zoning district. So there's two different zoning districts. If you flip to the next slide, please. This is a plan view, uh, Lytle Street to the left, uh, Tecumseh Street to the top. So everything that's, that's cross hatched is the R1A uh, VH district, everything in gray is the general industrial. So this, this sliver of property that was, that was purchased and added is in a different zoning district. That is proposed to become uh, just employee parking and a, and a small service yard. Um, there is also additional parking that is, that's, that's not part of this request, which is on the property. You can see that to the right. And then the top of the page is the separate parcel, which will have five parking spaces along Tecumseh Street, technically separate from, from the parcel that is the brewery building. Now, this is a more detailed site plan showing uh, to the south, again, that, that piece of property is um, what we're calling a service yard. It's going to be for employee parking only. It will be fenced from Lytle Street not visible from Lytle Street. There is the brewery to the north. There is the residential house to the south. We will fence completely that, that area, uh, installing a new fence for the, for the neighbor to the south. Um, it'll just be for employees. So the amount of in and out traffic is going to be very limited. You know, they'll, they'll pull in during the day. They'll work. They'll go home at night. Um, the, the parking immediately to the right there, you can see about 12 spaces with the handicapped parking space. That's not part of this request, but that's the that's the sort of bulk of the parking um, for patrons coming to the brewery. Then to the north, um, you can see the the smaller lot along Tecumseh Street, which is technically separate, still part of the same zoning district, but a separate parcel. So, Mr. Hackett, just let, just so that I understand, the twelve um, spaces in the rear are not part of this request because they're far enough distant from what is technically in the R district. So, the only waiver from the residential compatibility are the ones that are the three spaces to the side of the building that are actually in the R district, not just proximate to the R district. Correct. Okay. But so the, we're not worried about the 12 behind, but then the offsite are the additional five off Tecumseh. Correct. Correct. Okay. And is there a, is there, a, I, I know you, uh, Mr. Ayub said it was um, about uh, 20 feet away, but the walking distance is, is there, do you have to go down Tecumseh to Lytle to get into the property? No. So if, if you were to park along Tecumseh Street, you could come straight into the back. Okay. And, there's what an access done, from the back. Right. Fact, but what the we've main... done is put the public access to the building in the rear okay. so that it's served by the parking. So the furthest distance from the from the furthest parking space on Tecumseh to the door is only about 200 feet. Okay. So so well within the thousand feet that's got it. Okay. Required. Even if you had to go around the block, I think you'd still hit the thousand. I was just curious about the access. Right. And it's intended that that um, parking arrangement be recorded in some fashion? Yes. Okay. All right. So we had, we had looked, if, if you look to the next slide real quickly, it's just a letter from uh, Councilman Corey O'Connor, um, who's been working with David Cayley um, and sort of assisting in the assemblage of the property, um, just his support of these special exceptions. Okay. All right. Mr. Cayley, did you have anything that you wanted to add um, with respect to this project? I think uh, Joe and Tom did a great job in explaining it. Uh, just thank you for your thoughtful consideration. We're trying to uh, 
improve a part of the community with a lot of support from the R.K. Mellon Foundation. And uh, uh, hopefully you will see the logic of this and, and uh, allow us to proceed. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think you said that um, one of the neighboring property owners was also planning to attend. Can I check with Zubin to see if we have somebody else who's raising their hand with respect to this application? Yes, we have Chuck Kristen. Okay. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Could you identify yourself for the record, though, please? Sure. Uh, this is Charles Christen and Fred Haig. We are the residents at 5019 Lytle Street, which is adjacent to the property that is being considered for the employee parking lot. And um, I, I understand you were um, intending to um, voice your support for this project. Is that correct? Yes. Um, uh, Dave Colley has, has worked very well with us has been a good neighbor. Um, we feel confident that, you know, the any noise level or any disturbance in parking on, on Lytle Street is not going to be a real issue for us, that uh, they have every intention to drive the um, parking and and and, and uh, people visiting the brewery to, to the back of the property off Tecumseh and uh, not having people park on Lytle Street and that employee parking lot as, as was said, will be, you know, people will come in in the morning and leave in the evening when they're done. Um, so, so we, we feel, we feel okay with that. Okay. Fred has a question. I have a question with the parking as the employees leave for the day or in the evening when they're done working, will that be changed? Will be the, to stop people from parking their cars there. Because we have, we have four cars right now on the street that have no license plates, no inspection, flat tires, that have not been towed away yet. And what we don't want to have cars parked there to rot in this parking lot. Understood. And the uh, parking lot will be gated yeah, there, there'll, there'll be a fence on Lytle Street, so you won't be able to see the cars that are parked in there. Um, and then when the employees leave, they will they will close and lock the gate. Okay, thank you. Could you, um, I apologize, but I know there were two voices from the same phone. Could you identify yourself separately just so that we have it for the record? Okay, I'm Fred. I just talked about the parking lot. And Fred, what, what was your last name? Egg, H-A-A-G. Thank you very much. We You're welcome. It. Okay. And I'm Chuck Kristen. All right. Do we have um, Do we have anybody else who wants to participate in this hearing? Zubin. No. All right. Mr. Ayub, Mr. Hackett, Mr. Cayley, anything else you want to add for the record? No. Thank you very much for your time. I think uh, you you know, get a good glimpse from looking at the presentation package of what's being requested. And they, and they are um, special exception requests, not variances, and we appreciate that as well. So um, we're going to close this hearing and move on to the next. And uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Everyone be right. safe. All right. We're going to switch out to the next hearing. The next case of the morning is zone case 128 of 2020 for 4713 Chatsworth Avenue. Uh, do we, the applicant is identified as Ryan England. Is Mr. England available? Yes, we have Ryan England and Maggie Bog, Bogdanich. Okay. And uh, Mr. England, since you're the applicant, um, is there are you anticipating anyone other than um, Maggie, Maggie Bognovich? Bognovich, sorry. I, I am not, thank you. Okay. And are you going to be uh, presenting primarily? I am, yes. Okay. So um, I'm going to ask both of you to swear in. Um, if we could unmute Maggie, that would be great. Okay, can you hear me? We can, thank you very much. Um, so do each of you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. 
Thank you. And Daniel's going to read in the case. This is on case 128 of 2020 for 4713 Chatsworth Avenue. The applications for the change of use from community center to school, and they're requesting a special exception from 921.02.a.4, change from one non conforming use to another. All right. It's Hazelwood Day here at the Zoning Board. <laughs> Apparently it is. Good morning. This uh, property is a one-story building about 7,000 square feet located at 4713 Chatsworth Street. Um, there you see an aerial. If we can go to the next slide. Um, this location is next to a city park. Um, it is surrounded mostly by residences, although the building at the bottom center is a um, church that is not operational. And um, as you can see, there's a fair bit of vacant land around as well. If we can go to the next slide. Um, you can see the view. This is on Chatsworth Avenue looking north. And um, you see Minden Street to the right and the property kind of centered. Um, hardly any cars on the street, um, pretty quiet. If we can go to the next slide. And so this is kind of the, the opposite corner of the property above the property. Um, and so this is Monongahela Street. And, um, you know, as you can see, the residences on the left are, the residences are there, they're present. Um, the building is fronts closer to Chatsworth Street, although it's a large site and, and there's a lot of space around the building on all sides. And there's an existing- Just to, to mm -hmm. stop you for a second, um, I, and it's a, a proposed change of use and I appreciate mm -hmm. um, understanding the context of the neighborhood, but the building itself um, as a community center, uh, was it a, a, a something um, part of the community? I mean, who owned it? How was it sure. operated previously? Can we go to the next slide? Sure. Yeah, yeah so it was previously oh. a YMCA and operated uh, as such for many years. Um, they also were licensed as a daycare at the YMCA um, for 50 children. Um, you may recall we made a, a zoning board application in 2018 to use the space as an office and that project uh, did not move forward. And so now we are proposing to um, use the building as a school for up to 100 students. Um, the zoning district is R1DH and, and this is a special exception. Can we go to the next slide? Well, so the, yeah, and, and what we're interested in, obviously, with the change in use is mm -hmm. thinking about um, how the YMCA um, operated in the community and the intensity of that use as compared to um, what you're proposing. Definitely. And so the YMCA, I mean, just on a broad stroke sort of sense, the YMCA was an after school and summer camp use with um, Similar numbers of children. Um, the operating hours for the school are going to be generally 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., whereas the YMCA, the operating hours would have been more typically, you know, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, with a kind of 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. in the summers. So um, the operating hours are different. The intensity of the use is similar. Um, the, both the YMCA and the school had. Um, bus and van transportation, uh, but, you know, obviously kind of on the, the opposite ends of the day. And then, you know, both the YMCA and the school had um, students walking, students biking, students being driven, uh, staff driving and parking, staff walking, you know, kind of pretty similar, pretty typical compatible uses, but um, a different flavor of the same use, if it were. And is there, and I'm, you're, I'm sure you're going to get to a site plan, but um, I'd be curious about how parking was managed on site. You're, you're not requesting any variances from any parking requirements. So I'm assuming that parking is being managed on site. Correct. Yeah, there are, um, if, well, we'll get to a transportation slide that, that deals with that in detail. Okay. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so the Three Rivers Village School is a um, private school. It's currently located six blocks away on Elizabeth Street. Currently it has 25 students and three staff. Um, the maximum enrollment is 100 students and seven staff. It's a democratic, uh, independent K-12 school. Um, the next slide. 
So with regards to transportation, you know, the pickup and drop off is primarily by school bus, uh, realistically school van, um, but sometimes buses do show up right now. And, and the, as the enrollment climbs, definitely there will be more buses. Um, you know, kind of we're envisioning at full enrollment, a maximum of 20 private vehicles doing pickup and drop off as well. You know, parents, um, students do not drive themselves. Um, Chatsworth Avenue, if you may remember, is perfect for drop off and pick up by school buses. Nobody lives on Chatsworth Avenue. You've got the park on one side and the school on the other side. It's a nice broad street, a safe street with good sight lines. The staff mostly drive, although some of them do live in the neighborhood. Um, there are seven parking spots on site. Um, we propose uh, to continue those. That's our staffing level. Um, th there's actually a couple more um, parking spots on the north of the site that um, kind of front right on the street. We're not proposing to continue those. Um, if we look at parking use, so the zoning code says that a school um, should have a parking study, parking demand analysis, excuse me. Um, so if we look at the ITE um, private school land use category, it says that we need 39 parking spaces um, for our enrollment of 100. Uh, it's our opinion that that is not really an appropriate uh, land use category, although it's the one that most obviously um, has the similar name, but that land use category is more similar to a, you know, a private school in the suburbs where students drive themselves and, and you know, everybody drives. And that's simply not the case in this urban environment. Um, for context, the ITE land use for a middle school um, estimates a parking demand of seven to 11 spaces. Um, we're proposing that the seven on-site parking spaces, which are um, and that's our maximum staffing level, um, the adequate for the demand. If we can go to the next slide. But um, just so I understand, uh, Mr. England, you're relying on the ITE numbers, not a specific traffic study for this site or that's this true. school. We, we did not conduct a traffic study. Traffic on the street is light. Um, the traffic volumes that we are um, talking about with less than a, a dozen buses and, and up to 20 parents and seven staff um, those just you know don't don't even approach congestion for the streets um, uh, having been to the site at least 30 times myself over the past three years um, I've never observed you know more than two cars on the street um, and like I said, with the Chatsworth, I, I mean, if we were using Monongahela where there are residences, that would be a different story. But on Chatsworth, it's just the city park. Um, you know, the, this operation doesn't impact like somebody's residence. Okay, other operations. Um, the typical operating hours are 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, occasional evening activities, but the, the school has very light evening activities. They don't go later than 9 p.m. They're monthly or less. Um, trash service, um, you know, very minimal to comply with the, um, the service requirements. Uh, the condensers and the other kind of noise generating things are already existing and comply with codes. They're pretty small, um, especially because the distance from the property lines is very significant. Um, there's no uh, noise impact from those and, and we don't envision any uh, potential operations concerns. And I believe that's all we have. Okay. Uh, do you have a, is there a site plan as part of it that would you know, show I, where the park is? I apologize. I, can we go to the aerial? I, we have a site plan, but I just kind of totally Was the it. site plan part of your original package? I, that you I believe it is, but application? also I, I believe that it was submitted. I'm sure it was submitted, but um, That's a, that I, 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 this is fine. I'm just, I'm, I was curious about where the parking would go. And I think mm -hmm. you're, you're anticipating using the existing parking that's- Exactly. And you it, can see it at the bottom of the site. Is that there. Minden Street? Yes, that's Minden Street. And um, like I said, there's seven spaces. There's also a little more parking in, in concrete along Minden Street that we don't intend to use. Um, at, and I think actually, we haven't really figured out who's parking cars there, but somebody in the neighborhood Okay. We'll have to figure that out. Okay. All right. Um, 
Is it, do we have anybody um, not associated with the project who's interested in participating in this hearing? Um, yes, we do. Uh, Holly Santry. Well, I was going to ask Maggie first if she had anything she wanted to add, and then we'll move to Holly. Um, I think Ryan covered most of it. We are a very small school, and we anticipate having very little impact on um, on the neighborhood. There's three staff currently, and um, our rate of growth isn't so quick that we anticipate having 100 students anytime soon. But 100 is the maximum that you're anticipating for this particular site. Honestly, I can't say that for certain. Um, I think that we are anticipating somewhere more in the ballpark of 50 to 75 max. But it would allow for up to 100, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yes. OK, all right. All right, let's move to Holly, if we can unmute Holly. All right. Hello. Um, and could you identify yourself specifically for the record, please? Of course. My name is Holly Santry. Um, we're a homeowner on the corner of Berwick and Monongahela Street. And my husband and I are just in full support of the Three River School moving in. We think it would be a great revitalization of that space um, and hopefully will um, make a nice impact on the neighborhood. Oh, great. Well, thank you very much for, for participating here. Were you um, living in the same place when the site was being operated as the YMCA? Yes, ma'am, we were. Okay. And you don't anticipate that the impacts from the school would be any different from the YMCA? I do not think so. I think it would be um, nicer in, in the fact that there's no after school um, because I know that they would use the playground down there. And um, so this would be an opportunity so that the neighborhood kids could still use the playground instead of it being infiltrated by the YMCA kids. Not that that was bad, I just. <laughs> it's just an observation, okay. Yes, um, I don't see, foresee there being any impact. I, um, I, 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 I was curious to the fact um, of the community garden that's attached to it. Is that property being considered separate? I don't know the answer to that, but I think we're only talking about the school and the request to, to use the community center as the school. Okay, thank okay. you. All right. Anybody else who uh, would like to participate in this hearing? Yes, we have a Gregson Vo. Uh -huh. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yes, I'd like to know who actually is going to own this building? I can answer that. Could you identify yourself for the record? And My name is Gregson Vox. I live in Hazelwood. I live on George K. Red. However, I own two properties, which is why I was notified. I own the property directly across the street that's in between the uh, YMCA and the church. And then I also own a property that's a catacorner to uh, its diagonal from this uh, proposed school. Do you have a position with respect to the school use of the of the park property, or you're just curious about the ownership? Uh, I'm I'm a neighbor. I'm not sure what you mean by a position with the school. Well, I mean, are you for it or against it based on what? Oh, oh, I'm against it. I believe I, I need I need more information, but I believe I'm against it. Okay. Uh, the the information that I need is whether is who will own this building. Well, the information that you're requesting, it, um, would, the, would somebody from the applicant um, team care to answer that? Yeah, the building is owned by the Hazelwood Initiative and they will continue to own it and the Three Rivers Village School will be a tenant. Uh, the reason I have an issue with this is because the Hazelwood Initiative already owns the old Gladstone School, which is a large complex with ample parking. And I believe it would be more appropriate to move a school into that building than to this building and to change the usage. They already have a building that's zoned as a school and they should be developing that building and using that for this school project. Okay. Well, the application is that they're allowed to make the application and we're, we're reviewing it under the uh, provisions of the zoning code. 
well, yes, I believe this would have an impact. Uh, currently, I don't have houses on those properties, but I bought those properties with the intention of building houses on them. And so looking to the future, I think that would detract from the neighborhood. All right. Well, thank, thank you for making your position known and we consider all the testimony that is presented. Um, is there anybody else who would like to um, speak to this uh, particular application? No, there's not. Okay. Um, does th anything else from the applicant team? Not at this time. Okay. We're gonna close the hearing on this matter and um, move on to the next. Thank you for your participation. And um, the board will issue its decision and provide it to um, everybody who has participated. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, the next case of the morning is zone case 130 of 2020 for 3103 Brereton Street. And we have Giancarlo Lies. Okay. All right, uh, Giancarlo Lies, do we have, uh, are you presenting this application on your own or is there somebody appearing with you? It'll just be me. This is John Carlos speaking. You're you're going to need to speak up because we can't hear you. Um, it, it'll just be me. Okay, uh, very good. John Carlos speaking. Can you hear me now? Uh, if you can keep your voice up, that would be helpful for us and the court reporter. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask you to swear in first. Do you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, then, Miss Daniel's going to read in the the case for the morning. This is zone case 130 of 2020 for 3103 Brereton Street. The application is for the change of use from office limited to single family. They're requesting a variance from 914.02.A. One parking space is required per unit and none is proposed. Okay. So explain to us what's going on here. Yeah, so I guess just to start with a little bit of background, um, this building is owned by me and, and one business partner, uh, Quentin Carbone. He, he's not here with me today, but um, we own it under an LLC. The name of the LLC is Patina Real Estate and Development LLC. Um, and just to give background on why we bought the building, we were both residents of the area and we love the neighborhood. And one thing that we kind of noticed that um, it could use is more of a, a retail presence. Um, all that's there right now is a coffee shop and three local bars. Well, really it, can, it, can I stop you for a second? Sure. Are there, is there something in the material? You know your property better than we do. So yes. there's something in your material that would show us where it is and what we're talking about? Yeah, I, I don't have the map view on here. I, I could send it to somebody really quick. It's if, if, if you guys are familiar with the Polish Hill neighborhood at all, there's some pictures here. If you, if you know the Green Dome Church, um, it's kind of the iconic church in Polish Hill neighborhood. It's right across the street from that. Um, well, what what is that? I mean, what what it, the the request? All we know is that it's a request to change the use from office to a single family unit. So, what does yes. it, is there so, a picture of the building itself? Some some of these these actually do have the the, uh, the the building in them with those red panels there. That's the back side of the building. Um, and that picture to the far left, that's also part of the back side of the building. Um, I, we didn't have pictures of it. I guess it was kind of an oversight on our end. I, I could send those over to somebody quickly if, if well, that's helpful. But the, so the, the, could you explain the, the building is currently being used um, as office space? So no, it's, so it's a mixed use building. There's two retail spaces on the first floor. The office space is on the second floor and then there's two unfinished apartments on the third floor. The only space right now that's occupied is one of the retail spaces, and that's by the previous owner, which is uh, uh, the Jubilee uh, Association Food Pantry. So the request is um, to take the space that's currently dedicated to an office use and to use that space for an additional apartment building, I mean, for an additional residential unit when they're 
also residential units in the building. Yes. And there, uh, it does the property itself. I mean, does the building itself extend to the property lines so that there's no um, uh, parking on the site? Yes, there's a there's a yard on the side, but it, it wouldn't be conducive for a, a parking spot. Just because but the but the building itself and the uses that have existed within the buildings within the building hasn't relied on on site parking for any of the uses. Correct. Yes. Okay. So even full retail use, full apartment use, none of those uses have had on site parking. Correct. Okay. And um, it's, is it your position that there's sufficient on street parking that the um, one more um, residential unit without a parking space is not gonna make that much difference? Yes, that, that is our position. And it, these, these pictures that we had in here, this was just kind of to demonstrate that these were taken on the 10th, I believe, August 10th, 2020, um, just showing this is, these pictures were taken at 5.30 p.m. And this is right, you know, right around our building. Um, and, you know, there's visibly at least 15 spots. Um, both me and my partner, Quentin, um, have lived in the neighborhood for the past three years. And um, yeah, neither of us, you know, anytime we've been in the neighborhood, we've never had any issue finding parking. And that's kind of been the same, um, you know, opinion that we've heard from others living in the neighborhood as well. Okay. All right. Um Ms. Burton Falk, Mr. Richardson, any questions with respect to this application? No questions. No. Uh, Zubin, do we have anybody else who wants to participate in this hearing? No. Okay. All right. So um, I think it would be helpful for us to um, have you know, a site plan or photos of the building itself. So if you could supplement the record with those, I think we'd appreciate it. I can get this sent over. Okay. All right. Without addition to the record, I think we can move on and we'll close this hearing for today and we'll issue a decision accordingly. Okay. That's all right. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Moving right along. The, the next case of the morning is zone case 131 of 2020. For 5729 Pocusset Street. Um, the applicant is identified as Brian Smith. We have him, and he should be able to talk in a second. Okay. Yes, hi, how are you doing? Uh, hi, Mr. Smith, do do or do we have anybody else uh, participating with you in this matter? Uh, no, the homeowner should be on in case there's any other additional questions, but uh, for the most part, it's just going to be me. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to swear in and identify your position with respect to the project. Okay. Um, do you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and um, are you the architect for the project or? Uh, architect and a contractor. Okay, very good. All right, Daniel, could you read in the um, request, please? This is zone case 131 of 2020 for 5729 Pocusset Street. Uh, the application is for a new front deck. They're requesting a variance from 903.03.b.2. Minimum 30 foot front setback is required and 23 feet is proposed. Okay. And we're putting your materials up, Mr. Smith. So if you could explain what it is you're proposing to do. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the homeowner requested that we build a, uh, in addition to the front porch that's existing, um, and they want to do a 12 foot out, 16 feet across, which is the um, existing uh, length across the front porch of their existing porch. Uh, so we're basically just adding on to that an, an additional 12 feet. Um, when you bring out that 12 feet, it does uh, go into that variance, um, you know, that the city requires that you have from the, the street out to the front of the uh, any um, permanent structure. Um, so my request is just to see if we can actually have that come out um, to, to uh, currently build that project. Now, uh, uh, give, given the plans on this as well, and also um, how it's going to look once we get it on the house. And well, uh, it, it, can you just I, again, we're, we're looking at your site plan for the first time. And sure. what you're saying is that 
the porch as it exists complies with the 30 foot setback, but by adding this additional piece, um, you would be extending into that front yard setback by seven feet. Yes, correct. Okay. Can you can you um, point us to where on the site plan that would happen? Uh, can you see my mouse? Oh, uh, nope. I don't know if I can present my screen or not. No, it's it. Um, Daniel has it, but it just uh, there's. I can see the porch, and it looks like porch steps on the left hand side of the drawing by Pecusset Street. Yes, yes. So if you look at the uh, 3507 up top there, right by the porch, uh -huh. um, it's going to extend to about where the zero is at, maybe between the seven and the zero and come okay. straight down. And it's going to cut back to the right, right before the stairs. So where the porch is at, that area is 16 feet. So we're just going to extend out uh, 12 foot from that. Okay. So um, are there other materials in your presentation which show us a little bit about the house itself and... There we go. Well, yes. can we go back to the um, current conditions? Daniel, can you can you go to yes. the no, next page? There we go. Yeah, so if you can see, there's four pictures here. The top left one is from the right side of the house looking left. Um, and it just kind of shows you the incline of the hill. Um, the, Top right picture shows where the stairs that you can see on the uh, property um, uh, that you saw on the page before. So it goes to show you where the stairs are. We're not extending out that far. So basically we're just keeping the deck the same width as the porch. We're just bringing it out 12 feet. So it's not gonna extend to the left or to the right of the house. We're just bringing it up a little bit, to, uh, but it, it does go in that 30 foot variance. But part of the part of that 30 foot um, setback from Pocusset is the steep slope. Is that what you're saying? Well, actually, it, it ends at that steep slope. So it, there's enough room there to where it comes out right where that steep, steep slope starts. Uh, so that's where the end of the deck is going to be. So the, the, the end of the deck, as you're proposing it, would be at the top of the slope. And then you'd have 23 feet down to Pocusset? Yes, ma'am. OK. All right. What else, what else do you have to show us here? I think it's hard to tell from these photos where it would actually go. Uh, yeah, if you scroll down one more. Uh, so this is the end of the porch right here uh, that is currently existing. And as you can see, the deck comes out. Now this is just a, a, a basic 3D rendering. So this isn't exactly how it is, um, but it just goes to show kind of how the deck's gonna look on the front of the uh, residence as opposed to what it is now but it does go out to that steep slope and then it ends at that point. And then from that slope down to the sidewalk um, is roughly about 23 feet. Um, and it's, is it in there, is it to be a covered deck or? Uh, no, it's going to be an open deck. So it's going to be an open, basically an open front porch. Okay. Yeah, okay. But right, but right now, all there are, uh, there's a lot of ivy and uh, overgrown bushes. So we're going to take, uh, trim those back and make it look a lot better when we add the deck onto it. Are there um, any other uh, front structures on Pocusset that extend this far out towards the street? Or are they all pretty consistent with the 30 foot setback? I'm not 100% certain, but I, I do know that a few houses down that there's another homeowner that's wanting to do roughly the same thing. Um, that when we, they, they received the letters uh, from the city, they actually went down and talked to the homeowner saying that we're trying to do the same thing and to let them know how it goes. <laughs> well, that's, but that's I, I, here nor there. There's nothing in correct. the existing context that you're aware of. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, of course I didn't pay attention. So, I mean, there could be, but I, I would be lying if I said yes, because I honestly don't know. Okay. But there are. All right. Um, My question. Go ahead, please. Are you going to maintain uh, at least some of the shrubbery or put in any additional landscaping to kind of soften the sort of shape or, or maybe the under? Because I'm assuming people are then going to walk by and see underneath this, or is the grade of the hill higher that you can't do that? I really couldn't tell without yeah, a good street view. 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. So where the, the deck ends, it's at the top of that crest uh, from the hill, from the sidewalk to the street. Um, so as you're walking down the sidewalk, you will be able to see a little bit underneath that deck. Um, but what we can do, and it's no, no problem for us at all, as long as, you know, it, it's something that you guys would accept, we can actually put what's called a deck skirt around it to where it would actually uh, cover up what you can see underneath the deck. So it would make it look nice. Um, if the homeowner wants us to put shrubbery, we can do that. If that's something that uh, you would prefer, we can absolutely uh, take care of that and um, put in there in, in place of it. But we can do a, a skirt around it. Um, and it's going to be a wooden deck. So we definitely recommend, and I've talked to the homeowner about this too, they're going to maintain as far as staining the deck each year. So it's going to be a nice uh, darker color that matches more of, of the neighborhood um, uh, uh, visual effect. Uh, so it's not going to be as light colors you see in the picture here. We do that because we don't know what color they're going to stain it. Um, but right. it is going to be a, a color that's going to be darker and it's going to be look, it's going to look, the aesthetic appeal is going to actually look pretty nice uh, from the color that I spoke to them about. Um, but if you would like, we could definitely put a skirt around it to where you cannot see up underneath the deck um, if you're concerned about, you know, the, what would be underneath there. I'm just trying to figure out from a, uh, human perspective you know if a human is walking by what are is it hot is the elevation up high enough is it going to be screened in, in some uh way I, i'm not quite understanding the elevation of the street overall but I, I was just curious yeah no um so from the sidewalk up to the yard i believe there's about a three or four foot wall retaining wall and then the then the uh, hill slope goes back up roughly about that 20, 23 feet. Um, and then where it crests out to where the level of this uh, porch is at, um, that's where the deck's gonna end. Uh, so it doesn't extend out to where you're gonna see this huge structure as you're walking by and you look up and go, oh, wow, that's a huge uh, you know, front porch there. It's actually set back quite a bit to where um, from, the, from the top of the deck to the grade where we're gonna end it is only about 36 inches, which is about three feet. Um, Thank you. Yeah, but we can actually put a skirt there so you can't see up under there and make it look really nice if that's something that you would request. Okay, thank you for clarification. Sure. No, absolutely. Um, Mr. Richardson, did you have any questions? No. Okay, and um, Zubin, do we have anybody else who wants to participate in this hearing? We do not. Okay. Um, and recognizing that the property owners are uh, on the call, but um, I think the architect has made, a contractor has made a, a presentation that we can understand. So we will uh, close this hearing and thank you for your participation and we will um, issue our decision. Yeah, thank you very much. You guys thank have a great you day. Thank you very much. Right, take All care. Right. Uh, Moving on. Uh, the next case of the morning is zone case 137 of 2020 for 2610 Maple Avenue. And, and we have, oh, I'm sorry, we have Ryan England again. Okay. Mr. England, do you have anybody else who is going to participate with you in this um, application? Yes, Eleanor Williams of the Northside Partnership Project. Okay, Eleanor should be able to speak here in a second. And it's just the two of you? Yes, correct. Okay. All right. So, Eleanor and Ryan, uh, do each of you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And, Daniel, I'm going to shortcut you here. Um, there are a number of variances that are identified on the um, agenda. Uh, but the general proposal is for renovation of an existing school building for use as a community center. Um, and the variances are from uh, both residential compatibility standards and parking requirements. So, um, and I, I understand that this is related to um, the board's prior decision in zone K 76 of 2019. So Mr. England, Ms. Williams will ask you to explain what's going on here. Great, thank you so much, good morning. So yes, this project um, is for the former McNocker School, which is pictured, um, which the board reviewed in um, 20, 
2018 or 2019, I'm sorry. Um, and this is just a, a bit more of a specific, you know, some of the details on the build out and the occupancy of the building. Um, if we can go to the next slide, just as a refresher, this is a school on the edge of, um, to the right, it drops off towards 279 and to the left, there is a residential um, with a little bit of commercial mixed in district. And if we can continue to the next slide. Um, and just a view on Maple Avenue. So there are a few residences to the left and some vacant land. And then the school sits fairly close to the street, you know, with like a 20 foot setback from the street. And then continuing on. And then this is the view again from Maple Avenue above. And next slide. And then this is um, Hazleton Avenue down below, um, right next to where the, the picture is taken from. There are some residences, but across the street from the school itself, um, there's just a steep hillside. And to the next slide. Just, Mr. Uh, so, I, so I understand um, the variances um, being requested today. Are those issues that came up in the course of the project development? I mean, I guess, why were they not addressed in the original um, application? Correct. So the, the applicants um, came to the zoning board kind of on their own without um, an architect or any sort of development um, support. And so now we're looking at a, at a full project bid out and, and permitting. Um, so, the, the so the original request was more um, with respect to the use of the old school building, and now you're getting down to the specifics of how the operations would work within the building? Correct. The I, I mean, the building did not have a certificate of occupancy. So, I, I mean, they were taking a correct first step, but they, they did not have the entire scope in mind. Okay. No, I, like I said, I'm just mm -hmm. curious as to how, how we got to where we are now. That that. Yeah. That was all my question. Sure. Um, so this is the site plan with the building in gray, um, Maple Street on the bottom. There are three parking areas. There's a kind of a small up the hill valet um, <clears throat> parking area on the left. There is accessible parking, two spaces right in front of the school as well as bike parking. And then there is a larger um, parking area for 18 cars on the right. And if we can go to the next slide. So these are our, um, our setback issues kind of highlighted. So the existing parking areas um, are you know, across the street from residentially zoned uh, parcels and they, are, you know, they have five foot setbacks. Um, they're paved, the area is fenced. Um, it has a history of being used as parking, but the, the setback issues remain. Um, can we go to the next slide? So just for context, you know, that's the parking on the left with the paved area and the fence. And then across the street, those are residentially zoned parcels. I'm not really sure what the equipment's about. And then the next slide. You, you don't have an exhibit that shows where the, uh, it's all, well, it's all residential, right? It's all R, R1DH, right? So the uh -huh. school is in the R1. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a whole R1 district. You're not gonna get away from the R1 district. Correct. Yeah, there's not like another place. And so, okay. the, you know, these are all existing areas. We're not paving anything else. Um, you can see the driveway and the gate. Um, and then, um, okay. yeah. All okay, right. next slide. Okay, so we wanna talk about the parking, uh, you know, how much parking is provided. So the, the prior zoning decision said, um, provide adequate parking. Um, uh, our calculation of the active floor area and the staff uh, calculation of the active floor area are a little different. There's a, a pool in the basement, um, a 3,000 square foot pool area. Um, that's gonna remain vacant. I know staff included that in their calculation. So the zoning staff calculated the parking requirement kind of with the bike reduction included as 45 car spaces and 19 bike spaces. Um, we calculated it as 41 car spaces and 17 bike spaces um, using every piece of paved area on the site. We are able to provide 37 car spaces and 21 bike spaces um, on the site. So a couple things about that. One is this is a, 
a community center that serves a lot of kids in the neighborhood. You've got um, dance class, and football, weight training, and, and um, after school programming where the majority of the kids are walking um, to the site. Um, at, as it currently stands, the, um, the building's not full, but they're not using um, the fenced in parking area at all just because the parking demand is so light. Um, cheerleading practice, you know, activities such as that are, are what are going on right now. Um, secondly, the building is envisioning a, a mixture of uses where there are some youth serving and community serving uses. There are um, some people, and we'll, we'll talk about use in, in a second, but um, you know, um, some uses like um, an office or creative studios, you know, music studios, that sort of thing that um, the uses overlap and, and don't all have parking demand all at the same time. So um, we're envisioning some parking sharing, um, and so for those reasons, we think that providing 37 car parking spaces. Well, you're, you're requesting a variance and I guess the question is um, whether you're requesting a variance from the 45 cars um, requirement that um, staff has determined or the 41 um, space requirement that you've acknowledged, um, but you're saying that 37 should be um, plenty regardless of how you calculate it. Correct. Okay. Great. All right. And, and then moving on to uses. Can we go to the next slide, Danny? Thank you. Okay. Um, and we just, we wanted to have a, a bit of a conversation about uses. There are, there are a couple of things we want to talk about is one, the definition of community center and what is allow, an allowable use under that definition. And two, um, if there's a way that the board can provide some clarity. Well, I, I have to say the, the zoning board isn't a place for conversation. So um, I, would, I would say make your best case as to what it is that you would like us to do and we will determine whether we can grant that relief. So um, are you, I understand that the list of uses that you've identified are potential tenants. Mm -hmm. um, but some of those have specific definition under the zoning code, which are not necessarily subsumed within the, the community center use. And um, are, are you wed to these um, specific tenants for the ongoing and entire use of the community center? I mean, how, how is it that you would like us to approach that? Sure. So I think that what what would be ideal um, is if the board were willing um, to, in the course of their review, clarify that accessory uses um, uh, constituting no more than 30% of the floor area of the building that um, have other use categories in the zoning code, such as these uses are acceptable because they are accessory to the primary use of community center. Um, that would be kind of our ideal um, situation. I'm not sure if the board's willing to do that, but that's what we would request. Uh, did you, did you um, again, it's not a place for conversation. It's a place mm -hmm. for a request. So um, is this the list of uh, uses that you would like us to consider? Are you asking us for sort of open-ended approval for whatever you think might possibly come down the road could also be considered part of a community center use because you say so? I mean, I, I'm just not, I'm, I'm not really understanding what, what it is sure. that you are asking the board to um, do. We have tried to be comprehensive in our thought about what uses are. Um, all of these uses on this list are uses that we are, um, in conversations with tenants in or have interested tenants who would like to occupy spaces or would like to, like for example, the concert kitchen, we would like to build that out, you know, ourselves. Um, so yes, this is the comprehensive list of all the uses that we have thought about um, that we would like to be considered by the board. Well, I, I mean, just, I don't know how you can say an office use or a retail use is a community center use. So, sure. um, and I, I, it, 
again, without specific percentages, um, it's hard to say that those are accessory um, mm -hmm. because accessory not only means a smaller percentage of the primary use, but it also is um, something that you would typically associate with the primary use. Um, and again, offices and retail being separate and distinct uses permitted as primary uses under the zoning code, I'm not sure you're getting us to an understanding of how you would define those as accessory. Right, not to exceed 30% of the floor area of the entire building. Um, was well, is that for one use? Is it for the common? No, for the, for the accessory the uses as a whole. I mean, that I, again, that's like, I, 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 it's hard for us, I, it's hard for me to understand what it is exactly that you're envisioning or you're asking us to do. Right. If I could. Yes, if you could please, Ms. Williams, thank you. Yes, um, we were looking more at these type of services uh, that were coming to the building would benefit the community. That the people with the retail or um, things like that would help in some way with the um, underprivileged uh, people that are in the community. They could, you know, give away clothing. Um, we, you know, do some um, food distributions and whatever, whoever comes into that building would be part of the community and would benefit, the community could benefit from their services. And so that's kind of our vision of rental office space for these particular type of people that the people in the community would have access to um, these type of services without having to catch five and six buses to go to different communities to get these type of things. And, and, and I appreciate that. Um, the, the, the challenge from, my, from our perspective here is to understand how that would be managed. So if we were to, um, your aspiration and your intent may be for all of these uses to have a direct impact on the community, which is, which is obviously laudable. But um, if, if we just say, sure, rent an office to a lawyer or sure, have some retail component, um, there's, apart from your representation that it's your goal to have all of those uses being part of the community, is there a way that you're managing that? Is that something that would be um, a, a component of your, your lease to any of these entities? How, how are you ensuring that that would have some relation back to the community center use? Well, I well, think that there are two, two good limits. And one is that the accessory use does not exceed 30% of the floor area of the building. And so that they're accessory, right? They don't take over. And then two, um, yeah, I think that, that having the community serving um, aspect of the entities um, be a part of the lease and be clearly defined. And, and if necessary, the zoning administrator could review that. Um, I think that that is something that would be very clear. Ms. Williams, I mean, did you, I, Mr. England interrupted you, but is that? Um, no, that's about, that's basically what I was going okay. to say. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, Ms. Burton Falk, Mr. Richardson, did you have any questions of the applicants? No, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, Mr. Coleman, is there anybody else who on the um, line who would like to participate in this hearing? Not at this time. Okay. All right. Um, unless the applicant has anything additional to add, uh, we will consider the application and issue a decision. Nothing else. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Have a great morning. Okay. All right. Uh, next case of the morning. Are we caught up with time? Yes, we are. Okay. 
Next case of the morning is zone case 139 of 2020 for 519 54th Street. We have the um, applicant identified as Ryan Indivina. Uh, hello, good morning. Mr. Mr. Indivina, do you have anybody else who's participating with you in this hearing? Uh, yes, Rob Indivina uh, should be on as well as Michael Wright, the owner. I don't see Michael Wright. We have a Mark Schmidl. Okay, yep, I'm here. This is Robin Davina. Well, we're past the scheduled time. So um, I'm going to ask you both to swear in. Do each of you, uh, Rob and Ryan and Davina? Yeah. Do you each hear? Of... Sorry? I said, can you hear me? I'm, we I'm... can. This is Rob. Okay, but I'm going to ask you both to swear in. Do each of you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And should we be keeping an eye out for Michael Wright? Is there a phone number we should be looking for? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hello? Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know if, and Ryan is on the road, so he may be coming in and out. Okay. Well, uh, we're going to ask one of you. The, the, I'm going to ask Daniel to read in the case, and then one of you is going to have to start. So, it's fine. Daniel, this, you're on. This is zone case 139 and 120 for 519 54th Street. The application is for the construction of three new four story townhomes. They're requesting a variance from 905.02.C, 3,200 square foot minimum lot size required, 2,002, 2,339, and 2,387 square feet is requested. Maximum height, three story permitted, and four stories is requested. Maximum area of disturbance, 50% uh, permitted and 55% requested. And a special exception from 911.01.G, Single family attached homes permitted in Hillside District via special exception. Okay. Which Indivina is going to start? <laughs> Ryan will start. Apologies for this. We're just on, on the road here. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Bye. Okay. So, um, yeah, good morning, everybody. Good morning, board. Um, first uh, slide here is just indicating the location of the site. Uh, uh, so it's highlighted in red. It is located in Upper Lawrenceville on 54th Street and Kent Way. Uh, Kent Way is a, is a fairly minor um, side street uh, that occurs at the uh, basically the northwest corner of the site. Um, so it's again highlighted in red. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, two context images of the existing site. So currently there's a single family house uh, structure on the site. Uh, with the remnants of a pool um, at the uh, basically the southeast corner, um, and the property uh, exists basically on the corner of Kent of Kent Way, which is the uh, image on the right hand side that's looking up Kent Way, uh, and then the uh, 54th Street is on the left hand side, looking uh, to the uh, uphill to the right. Next slide. Uh, another uh, site image, this is uh, of the rear of the property as it currently stands today. Again, there's a single family house structure. Uh, there was a, a cut area provided for essentially gravel uh, rear lot parking. Um, the property exists in the Hillside District, which is part, part and portion of the, uh, the special, ex special exception component of this presentation, um, as well as the, uh, the site disturbance. So this picture uh, both in in, is intended to indicate the extent of the uh, existing structure, but as well as the extent of um, existing alteration to the site uh, that would differ from a virgin condition. Uh, next slide. Next slide, sorry. Uh, I'll walk through the proposed project at the at the moment, and we'll, and we'll touch base on each one of the variances. So this is um, the proposed layout for the project. Uh, Kent Way is on the left-hand side. Uh, 54th Street is on the, the bottom side. Um, we're proposing to create three individual similar sized townhouses. Uh, the ground level will be composed of a two, two car garage um, accessed off 54th Street for each of the units, as well as the entry to the, uh, to the unit on the left side of those garages. Um, go to the next slide. 
This would be the uh, first floor, essentially the ground level uh, in a typical arrangement of these units. Uh, they're comprised essentially of a living room on the front, uh, staircase, bathroom in the middle, and then uh, kitchen, dining room in the back, as well as a rear patio space uh, towards the uh, upper side of the, of the parcel. Next slide. Uh, just you know, uh, the next floor, the second or the third floor uh, is basically uh, three bedrooms, two bath arrangement, and then the next next slide. Uh, the top floor would be a uh, sort of a family room space, and then a large deck facing uh, 54th Street. Go next slide. Uh, just a quick uh, image of the of the property as we propose to uh, proceed with the project. Um, again, three three units as they they would step up 54th as well as up uh, Kent Way. Um, the existing conditions on both of those streets are rather steep, steep slopes. Um, so as you can see, they, they step pretty nicely up the hill. Uh, they are again set back off of 54th by about 10 feet, which is differ different from the adjacent parcel, which you can see um, in the far right corner of the image, which is an existing essentially three and a half story structure. Uh, next slide. So I'll touch base on the uh, on uh, each variance as we go through here. So this is a, in, in an effort to address the um, the requirement for 3,200 square foot minimum lot size in the hillside district. Uh, this is the existing condition as it stands today. Uh, the building itself straddles two existing separate parcels. So lot A is currently 2,729 square feet existing. When uh, in the hillside district, this would be required as a 3,200 square well, foot. Well, um, if if I'm doing my math correctly, you could put um two units on it and comply with the minimum lot size requirement with just a little bit left over. That so is correct, yes. Why, uh, what's the basis for um, asserting that that um, a variance to allow three where two would fit perfectly well um, would be uh, appropriate? We were basing it upon the, uh, maybe the next slide is probably a good way to indicate what we were uh, basing that consideration on. So we did analysis of all the all the adjacent parcels within the hillside district. So essentially, all the parcels along 54th, where the from the pink pink existing parcel, all the way to the to the next street, as well as up Kent Way, as well as on both the, uh, the the let's say the northeast corner of Kent Way, as well as directly east of this property. And sorry, the directions are a little bit uh, crossways here. Um, but of the adjacent 22 parcels, 14 of them are not uh, to the 3,200 square foot requirement. They're all actually 2,000 square feet. Um, so we're looking at this more as this, the context of the neighborhood, more so than the, than the hillside context. Um, so for instance, the neighboring property itself, uh, where the single family house is located is 2,000 square feet. Um, and certainly across the street on 54th, which is part of the R1, uh, R1 district, uh, it's basically a whole row of uh, row houses, which are significantly less than 2,000 square feet. Right, so, but you've got we've, you've got a whole um, host of parcels there that actually do comply. So I guess the, are there what's what's the hardship? Why I mean, apart from um, your assertion that three would be more consistent than two, um, again, two complies with the requirement. There should be some basis for or asserting a hardship that would allow the, the three? Uh, I guess, again, we were trying to relate it more to the context and create the, um, the sort of row house arrangement or, or attached townhouse arrangement that is different, let's say, than the more uh, maybe suburban nature of a larger parcel. Um, so if we were to approach it from the two existing parcels um, and simply locate a townhouse on one or townhouse on the other, those parcels would be significantly larger than sort of the general context of Upper Lawrenceville. So from a directive standpoint of um, having these fit within um, a scale standpoint, as well as just sort of a feasibility slash financial arrangement, you know, as far as how these, these units could be constructed and sold, uh, you know, the developer felt it most reasonable to, to try and coordinate these units with their um, similar parcels as, they're, as they sit adjacent rather than trying to make them larger, um, more, let's say, um, I don't want to say uh, like Highland Park size lots versus uh, Lawrenceville's, Lawrenceville lot. Um, you know, certainly from the, from the standpoint that there are existing lots that are uh, uh, larger than 3,200 square feet, we certainly, uh, you know, see that, but at the same time, we wanted to make them um, smaller than the 3,200 square feet, which we feel is more in, in context with the uh, with Upper Lawrenceville. Well, 
Well, I mean, your feelings aside, um, the board does need evidence um, to grant variances. So sure. um, I, again, I, I, is your the basic argument is that um, it's your position that a 2,000 square foot lot or it would be more consistent with the neighborhood than the 3,200 that's required and that you could meet with um, with two lots instead of three. Uh, that, that's correct, yes. Okay. Uh, do you wanna go to the next slide, please? Oops. Uh, I you're on, on mute there, Ryan. Yep, sorry about that. Um, this is a enlarged uh, enlarged uh, view of what the uh, what the three lots would be in addressing the the square footage of each. So again, we'd have a two thousand two square foot on the corner, twenty three thirty nine, and a twenty three eighty seven square foot lot um, by subdividing the existing parcels into three. I'm certainly addressing the same same consideration that uh, we just presented as part of the larger context of the site. Uh, next slide. Um, I'll address the, uh, the site disturbance uh, next. So um, we looked at it holistically as the, the entire site. So within Hillside District, you are required to, uh, to disturb it at maximum 50% of the site. Um, the hatched area uh, indicates the amount that we are, the hatched area indicates the uh, extent of a 50% site disturbance. And then the additional 300 square feet of site disturbance would be required uh, for construction of these units, primarily as a result of the, the steep condition of the site. Um, well, so if you, and again, um, if you had two units instead of three, would you be able to comply with the um, maximum area of disturbance requirement? Um, potentially, I think the, the the issue in this particular case, the hillside district is, is or hillside district and the site disturbance requirement is predicated on virgin hillside condition. In this case, essentially the, the hatched area all the way to the, to the 300 square foot line uh, is roughly um, been altered already. Uh, it's been disturbed already as part of the, you know, the image I showed you in the beginning there, uh, indicating the cutback on the sort of gravel lot space. So in that sense, you know, we would still have to disturb some amount of that space to essentially make that a safe condition. Um, you know, currently that, that site has been cut out, but not necessarily retained in any way. So to impact that existing cut, you would have to install a new retaining wall and as such impact that square footage. Um, you know, we felt that, uh, you know, basically disturbing what amounts to, what amounts to be about 4% more than the, than the minimum requirement or maximum requirement was within reason in, in the sense of the arrangement of the existing sites and the, the need to um, cut back a, a good amount of it just to essentially build anything. The disturbance is really uh, related more to the depth of the, of the project rather than the width. So having two units wouldn't really affect that. You can see those contour lines that go horizontally across the page are really extent of the existing disturbance. So we're really not going beyond what's disturbed already. So there's already it probably in excess of 50% disturbed. Do you want to go to the next, next slide? So uh, this will address both sort of the site disturbance, but as, as well as the uh, number of stories. Um, so for the number of stories arrangement, we really looked at how we can uh, accommodate the building on uh, essentially a, a, the requirement, which is three stories, um, and locating the building so that it would be flush with 54th Street. Uh, this, this section indicates how much of the ground floor would be within the site, within the hillside. Um, so the dark gray is obviously existing conditions. The light gray would be the amount of uh, removal of the site would, that would be required to install a three-story unit. And as such, uh, I'd say, you know, close to 70% or 80% of the ground floor level would be windowless. Um, so from a functional standpoint, um, in, uh, as a residence, obviously that's not, that's not possible. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. What we looked at instead is essentially raising those three habitable floors up to be at, uh, at, at roughly grade at the rear. Uh, again, addressing the fact that there's a cutback already and installing retaining walls uh, to properly mitigate the hillside uh, features. 
and then uh, we would locate a garage at the 54th Street level. Uh, that garage is only a partial level, so it would only uh, extend, you know, roughly 60% into the footprint of the, of the uh, units above. You'd have two full foot full footprint units uh, as the second and third floor, and then the top floor would be set back again. Uh, that's in an effort to, uh, you know, not create a very large, uh, essentially what amounts to be a four-story unit. Uh, and related a little bit more to the, to the neighboring context as far as how that's, the building sits on the site. So by setting back the top floor significantly, uh, you know, roughly about 12 feet back, that uh, pedestrian experience would really be in context with the neighboring properties. Uh, if you want to go to the next, next slide. Uh, just two images of neighboring, neighboring conditions. Uh, the one on the right-hand side is the existing house to the, to the, uh, the south. Uh, it's directly adjacent to this parcel. So as you can see, they have a, essentially a full ground floor, second, third, and then a, a, an eaved uh, third or fourth floor uh, with the gate with the uh, projecting dormer. Um, so we are trying to relate our, you know, the height of our units and the arrangement of the unit similar to that. Uh, and likewise, further up 54th Street, uh, on the left-hand side is a new construction project where they've introduced roughly the same arrangement as, uh, as this project. Um, ground floor garage that's uh, we lost you there yeah, right now. Yeah, so that essentially this is the same arrangement um, where there this is a four story unit uh, within the, the hillside and that is just trying to establish context with <laughs> again uh, so the idea there is to, the way we arranged it uh, based on reacting to the site and making the buildings fit properly on the site. We essentially still have a three story facade along the street, stepping back that four story um, and stepping that up in the, the back of the ground floor. So essentially we've got an offset three story building that takes up four, store, four floors. But again, the, the uh, appearance from the street level would be that it's a three-story building. It's but there, and the, I, I have to assume that it, because the variance request is only from the number of stories, that it would not exceed 40 feet in height. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Uh, you can go next, next slide, please. Uh, and then this will be the, just the last image to show you a little bit more context uh, in the neighborhood. So these uh, groups of houses are across the street on the perpendicular streets to 54th. Uh, similar arrangement where they've had to deal with the site conditions where they've raised the, raised the units, uh, essentially a full floor above grade, above street level. Um, one, on one case, to the right-hand side, you have two-story units that sit on, a, on an elevated plinth. And on the left-hand side, you have three-story units that sit on an elevated plinth. So again, our, our goal was to was to match existing conditions uh, as much as possible. Uh, certainly fall within uh, below the, the height threshold, um, and just because of the nature of the site uh, and, and how much it uh, it steeply rakes up towards along Kent Way, that we would uh, introduce the garage to sort of found space. Uh, and I think with that, that concludes our presentation. Okay. Um Zubin, do we have anybody else who seeks to participate in this hearing? Yes, we do. We have a Mark Schmidl. Yes, uh, I'm here. Could you identify yourself for the record, please? Uh, my name is Mark Schmidl, and I am a homeowner on uh, Kendall Street, which if you go up Kent Way and take that right, uh, and go up the steep hill behind it. Uh, I own one of those smaller lots for, uh, almost directly behind uh, the house that you see next to the subject lot here. Okay. All right. Could you explain what your position is with respect to what's sure. been proposed? Sure. Uh, I bought that house a year ago um, uh, and we bought it mainly because of the view of the city. Uh, the people that have lived up on that hillside, I can't speak for them all, but They've been there for 30, 40 years, probably because of that beautiful view um, of the city that we have up there. Yes, we have to go up Kent Way, which is horribly paved and put up with very steep uh, hillside conditions, but the people have lived there and we've been there for a year and enjoyed the view of the downtown and the city. My concern is uh, by putting in four stories 
Um, not, not so much for this property, but if you grant a variance for four stories for this property and the way the development in the neighborhood seems to be going with these very boxy modern places, if you step that up the hill because the hill is steep there on 54th Street and the next house says, well, they got a variance. I'd like a variance for four stories. Next thing you know, the view is going to be gone from our house and our property values will decrease significantly. So that is my my main concern is it is. Uh, well, the, 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 the challenge for us um, is that there are two ways of defining height in the code. One is by stories and one is by feet. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a request of fitting four stories within the 40 foot height limitation, which is why I asked about the 40 foot height limitation. Yeah, and I was looking at those drawings there and I was trying to see if the height of this building would be taller than the building that is currently there up the street from this lot. The, that other house that's up the street from it. That this well, and it's, it's not based on a comparison with other, it's the 40 foot is the, the height, but and then there's three, it's 40 feet, three stories. And this is a request for 40 feet, four stories. So it's a it's an anomaly in the code. Okay. We, but we have to consider, and, and I, I appreciate your concern about um, the impact of these structures. Um, but did you, did you have anything else that you wanted to bring to the board's attention? No, I just wanted to uh, voice my concern. Okay, and we, we do appreciate that. It's, it's always, it's important for us to understand um, the community view. Uh, with that, I actually um, would like to ask um, the development team um, if this had been reviewed with any of the community groups. Uh, sorry, this is on mute here. Um, so we, uh, the developer had reached out to Lawrenceville United uh, and uh, was not able to get a meeting with, uh, with Dave Brennigan, who runs uh, Lawrenceville United, but we did meet with one of their board members, presented the project, uh, and asked them to distribute uh, the project to the rest of the Lawrenceville United community group. Uh, as such, we did not receive any feedback uh, one way or the other, um, but certainly you know, reached out uh, numerous times to have that conversation. Okay, thank you. Zubin, is there anybody else on the on the line who would like to participate in this hearing? No, there's not. Okay. All right. Um, with that, we're, we are going to close the record for this hearing this morning. Um, and thank you all for participating. But we're going to move on to the last case of the day. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right. And the last case of the day is um, zone case 134 of 2020 for 1308 Columbus Avenue and 1807 Fulton Street, parcel 22F225. Um, the applicant is uh, Gregory Peterson. And Madam Chair, I'll be recusing from this case. All right. And if you go off mute and off camera, we'll We'll give you a high sign when we want you back. Thank you. Do we have an applicant here? Yes. Greg Peterson. I'm here. Greg is here. Uh, Greg, do you have um, others who are participating with you in this matter? Yes. The uh, mosque as a, an attorney that represents them, he will be the lead here. And his name is uh, David Montgomery. He'll be speaking. And uh, Montgomery. All right. There's a civil engineer named Chris Richardson. He okay. will, he's property civil engineering. He'll, he will have input as well. And we have a uh, owner's representative, Phil Snow, who is available if questions are needed from him. Very good. All right. I'm going to ask all of you um, to swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I'm good because Mr. Montgomery was identified as the attorney. Um, I'm gonna is are you going to make the presentation or is somebody else starting with the presentation? And we, Mr. Montgomery is muted at this point. Hello. 
Madam Chair, can you hear me? We can now. Could you speak okay. up, please? Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the zoning board for hearing our case this morning. Um, David Montgomery, 100 Ross Street, Suite 510, well, Pittsburgh, it, Pennsylvania. I, I, Dave, uh, Mr. Montgomery, we we had not um, we haven't read the case in yet. I'm just trying to ascertain whether you're going to be presenting or um, if you're allowing different witnesses to testify. Uh, I will be introducing the case, and we will go in this order. Mr. Richardson, uh, the engineer, will discuss the site plan. Mr. Peterson is the architect. He's provided elevations showing the project. And then we have Mr. Snow, who is uh, here on behalf of the mosque, who okay. can answer well, then, operational questions. Before we get too far, I'm going to let Daniel read the case in so we know what we're talking about. Okay. This is zone case 134 of 2020 for 1308 Columbus Avenue, 1807 Fulton Street, parcel 22F225. The application is for the construction of, an, of a new one-story mosque. They're requesting a special exception from 911.01.G, religious assembly permitted in as special exception in R1A zoning district, and the special exceptions from 916.09, Playground shall not be located within 30 feet of residential zone property. Dumpster shall not be located within 30 feet of residential zone property. And parking lot shall not be located within 15 feet of residential zone property. All right. Now, Mr. Montgomery, please oh, okay. proceed with your case. Thank you very much. Uh, again, it's David Montgomery, attorney for the Light of the Age Mosque. I'm at 100 Ross Street, Suite 510, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We're here to uh, ask for special exception relief for this uh, new construction for this mosque being uh, developed on a consolidated parcel of vacant ground in the Manchester neighborhood. Just by way of background, we presented this project to the Manchester Citizens Corporation on July 13th, and we have a letter of approval that should be in the file from the board of directors of MCC. I think you mean to say a letter of support? Or, uh, well, they, they've approved, they've supported the project. Yes, you're correct. And, you. uh, and Councilman uh, Lavelle has also issued a letter, letter of support for the project that should be in the file. Uh, this project is, was originally applied under 1308 Columbus Street, but uh, the address has now been uh, changed to 1807 Fulton Street. Uh, and that'll be the address going forward for the mosque. Okay. Uh, yeah, our, we're asking for a special exception relief. This is a religious assembly, and that's under 911.04A53. And uh, the special exception is uh, granted uh, if we can show that parking demand shall be addressed uh, so as to meet parking needs for the normal one event use and discourage parking on nearby residential streets. We'll have uh, Mr. Richardson uh, describe the site plan and how it addresses the, uh, the other issues of uh, uh, special exception that we have to address. And that regards a patio area, which has been uh, also described as a playground within 30 feet of residential property, a dumpster, which is located within 30 feet of residential property, and then the parking lot, which is seven spaces on site within 15 feet of residential zone property. So uh, first up here, I'd like to have Mr. Richardson uh, direct the board's attention to the site plans we've submitted as exhibit one. We have that with on the shared screen, so. Okay, Mr. Richardson, can you uh, go through the uh, sheets of the site plan we've supplied to the board and explain, um, uh, describe where the, where the parking is located, where the dumpster is located, and uh, where this patio area that's been described as a uh, playground is located and, uh, on the site plans. Be before, before you go too far, I'm just wondering if you have other exhibits. Um, we're looking at a bare site plan and you all know the, the site better than we do. Are there any materials um, that show the context of the neighborhood or the, the site and the context of the neighborhood? Yes, uh, if the board turns to exhibit three, those are Google Earth images that show uh, what the property would look like 
in the in the context of there the neighborhood. There we go. Okay, I just I it, it's helpful for for us to understand where it is in the in the community. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, if you look at the the rendering of the the Google Earth images, you'll see uh, the property is bound by uh, Fulton, which is. Uh, uh, on, on the near side of the mosque image. Uh, and that runs into Columbus Avenue and Warner Street is the more narrow street behind the mosque. And this is in the Manchester Chateau neighborhood. Okay, thank you. You'll see it's a one story, one story mosque. Uh, and there is a sort of a community playground area, caddy corner to the uh, mosque on the vacant ground. And the, the um, more industrial building immediately next to it? Behind it, yes. I think there's That's a behind. residential okay. structure in front of that. And then there's, a, uh, then there's that industrial type building. And then there are railroad tracks uh, on the other side of that street, uh, which are okay. uh, pretty prominent in the neighborhood. And then there's a church directly across the street from the, directly across Fulton from the mosque. Okay. Thank, thank you for setting that context. That's You're helpful. very welcome. And, All right. Uh, and, and Madam Chair, if you were to look also at Exhibit 4, which has some of the exhibits from the parking plan, you'll see that there's a larger uh, excerpt from the Pittsburgh Not Real so Estate fast, website. Daniel, go back. <laughs> Sorry. There's, a, there's an excerpt from the Pittsburgh Real Estate website that shows the entire neighborhood. Uh, lot and block view. And that runs from Chateau all the way back to the subject property. We've, we've, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm more interested in the Google renderings, but there, there we go. There, there we go. Thank you. Oh, th and that's helpful to understand where the, where the railroad tracks are as well. Okay. All right. Sorry, sorry to, uh, take you out of sequence there, but that's helpful oh, for us. No, not at all. Uh, so I, I turned this over to Mr. Richardson, our engineer from Hampton Technical to describe the site plan and uh, the various features of the uh, proposed development. Okay. Uh, can you hear me good? We can, thank okay. you. All right, <clears throat> um, if we go back to the site plan, uh, go up, up. Uh, we can do right here, the landscaping plan, that's good. Mm -hmm. So as you see, our lot is not, that big even though we, we uh, took five lots and consolidated into one main lot um, we have the building which sits on the east side of the lot and when we have a small parking lot which can only fit seven spaces um, the parking lot provides seven spaces and functions as a safe drop-off area due to the size of the lot there's no available space to create additional parking or arrangements have been made as the attorney have said with the uh, neighborhood churches for a additional parking on this site. And then the um, location of the dumpster. The location of the dumpster uh, provides suitable access off, um, off of Warner Street. It is located in the parking lot area so that roll-off truck can drive through the lane after collection of the dumpster on a weekly basis. The nearest building to the dumpster is the back of 310 Columbus Avenue, which sits to the left side of our lot. And then the closest side of that building would be the rear, it would be 50, um, 58 feet away. And the second would be the structure that's, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, the unoccupied um, structure on the corner of Warren Street and Fulton Street that's approximately 109 feet away from the dumpster. Um, the but trash. It's, but it's, it's proximate to the, re how close is it to the residential property? It's 15 feet. Right. Okay. Yeah. But, it's, but you're saying that the actual residential structures are far, farther away or the, the um, occupied residential structures are farther away. Yes. Yes. Okay. Got it. All right. I, the, I'm just trying to, because we have to um, look at the, the relief that's being requested. So 30 feet is required, but 15 feet is requested. Yes, if you look at the lot, the overall lot size is about um, 90 feet in depth off of uh, Fulton Street. So the only way you could get that 30 feet, it would have to be like in in the middle of the lot, which would but, be and the, and the selection, I mean, the site that you've selected is um, 
the most sort of the least obtrusive and you you intend to have a um, screen dumpster location um, that's also accessible and not intrusive into yes the yeah so it is going to be um, um, screened by a CMU and architectural CMU uh, can constructed and there should be uh, there if you look at the landscaping plan we do have uh, plants shrubs around it and a tree so there's two trees on Warner Street right there to the left they will provide some um some <clears throat> screening some screening Protection. sorry some yeah. screening no, that's fine. as well okay so and then the the elevated grass pep patio i know on the plans we have right now they do show it as a um as a kids playground area but right it should be an elevated grass uh patio <clears throat> and the nearest building to the elevated grass pet patio again is the abandoned building that sits across from w warner street so it's the one um on warner and uh fulton right there and um the grass patio is to be built right on the uh right inside the pr pr property line uh just off of warner street due to the city parking requirements um and the building location, there's no other su suitable location for this feature. Yeah, because we have to have the parking on the left-hand side of the, by the lot, and it really leaves no more area on our lot to build an outside feature. Um, so, but, but, and, and I've heard it, you, the various descriptions as patio or playground, it's, it, is it intended as sort of a multifunctional outdoor space to support the use? Yes, and then Greg P. Peterson, he can answer more to that. Okay. And then um, the next one is the parkings within 15 feet of the residential lots. Um, we did have- Hang on, hang on, and I, I apologize for this, but going back to the outdoor area, you're saying that extends to the property line. So the, um, the actual request is that uh, the 30 foot setback is required, but zero is requested. Yes. Okay. I, just like I said, I'm just trying to understand what relief is being requested. Yes. No, so, thank you for and, that. And, and then moving to the um, parking, um, where, where's that? that? That's all along the side there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, the first um, scheme that, was per, per, uh, that we actually had, the building was on the left side and the parking was on the front of Fulton Street. Um, there is, uh, per Domi regulations, you cannot um, have a, um, a, a driveway within 60 feet of a, a intersection. And the uh, groups, when we met with the uh, na na neighborhood, um, Man Manchester, <clears throat> they did not like it either. So the building was put on the front of Fulton Street in the parking and back. Okay. And since we did put the parking and back, it, it is now within 15 feet of a residential area. <clears throat> and then uh, there is a solid, there's, there is an existing solid f uh, six foot frame fence along that left-hand side um, that, that the neighbor did in install, who knows how many years ago. And then that uh, fence also also act acts as a, um, it, they cannot see the parking, nor can they see the cars or the lights of the cars due to that fence. Plus, we do have some landscaping along that side to help with the but cars. The, but the, again, again, I'm going to ask the question: What's what is the actual setback that's being provided? Um, it's right, going to be five foot. Okay. So instead of 15, we're going to have five, and the dumpster would be 15 instead of the 30 as well. Okay. And so the space parking, is parking is a little bit different. So, but the what, what you're saying is that on that line. Um, there's a fence, there's a proposal for additional um, landscaping as well. Yes. Okay. And is there, did you say that there's an occupied structure on that property? Yes. Yes, there is. Okay. All right. And it's shown on the, the, uh, the um, Google plans that we showed you before. <laughs> All right. All right. I'll send it over to Greg Peterson. He can fill in any gaps. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you for hearing us. Um, the mosque is a, a single story structure with a, a undeveloped basement below. The site slopes about two feet from Columbus down to Warner. So when we looked at how we organize the accessibility requirements, 
for people to get in and out of the building that may have mobility issues. <laughs> there is uh, accessible, uh, adaptable parking among the parking spaces in the back on the site so that they can come around the building and go up the ramp. The front of the building fronts on Fulton Avenue. <laughs> and uh, it has, it has uh, an area along the exterior of the building along Columbus that is an exterior courtyard that will be primarily quiet prayer space, but maybe used for other activities as well. It's fenced, but it's open. Is there, um, uh, Mr. Peterson, is there a particular exhibit that you want us to be looking at? Because we're still looking at the site plan. Uh, you could go to one of the elevations. I don't know the exhibit number. But... Exhibit two. Yeah, that one's fine. There we go. This is, this is the Fulton Street elevation, which is the front of the building. Uh huh. And you can see on the left side, which is Columbus, there is an fenced exterior courtyard there that is used by the by the mosque people and a small minaret that we're still developing the design for over there. But it's it's not functional, so it's not going to disturb the neighborhood with anything noise or people or anything. It's more of a symbol uh, of the Muslim faith. The large structure to the right of it there with the dome on it is the prayer room, which accommodates about 100 people. And we'll again pick up some of the Islamic imagery that we're trying to represent here for the identity of the building. You can see the ramp coming up at the front of the building. That's the accessible entrance. It goes up to an entrance patio along Fulton. It has two entrance doors because they split the congregation into men and women. Uh, so they have separate entrances. It's a covered patio and stairs down on both sides back down to the sidewalk. The patio or the patio on the far right, which has kind of been mislabeled, I think, as a children's play area, but it's really a multi, as you pointed out, it's really a multi-purpose grass patio. It's just elevated so that we don't have to provide steps down to it uh, to make it easily accessible for people with limited mobility. And it has a fence around it for security purposes. The fences are there primarily for security purposes, as you read in the news recently, there's issues there we're trying to address. <laughs> um, the building is a concrete block with a thin set brick veneer wainscot on the bottom and decorative drive it above that with thin set brick up into some of the archways. Well, and, and recognizing that we're the, we're the zoning board, not the planning commission, we, we appreciate right. The architectural features, but um, I'd like to really focus on the the functionality and the um, considerations that we have for the special exception. Okay. Um, and primary among those is the um, requirement for parking demand to be addressed to meet the needs. And the um, there's not a variance request from the parking requirement, so. I wonder who would best explain um, what the parking requirement would be and how the, that's met, either on-site or off-site? I can go through that as a beginning point for your understanding. The congregation is approximately 100 people in the mm -hmm. building. And under the zoning rules at uh, one space per four, that yields us its parking requirement for 25 spaces. There are seven spaces in the back on the property, as Chris said, that are primarily used for drop off administrative purposes and people with disabilities. The remaining 18 spaces, we are accommodated in the parking plan that we submitted to you that will be in street parking. And uh, they have the mosque has made arrangements with two other churches nearby to uh, provide additional parking at their spots for the for the required 25. Well, and, and that, that sort of raises a dilemma. Is that an additional special exception to meet the parking requirement um, with offsite parking or shared parking? I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. Because typically, because if you're relying on parking that's not on the site to meet the actual requirement, you can't count street parking because that's for everybody, but if you have specific arrangements with other lots, um, it, 
like I said, there, there are different different ways of doing that. But if we need to be considering a special exception for offsite parking, um, it's better that we do it now. Well, we I'll, I'll let David and Phil talk about that a little bit. They're more okay. conversant than I am. But I, I would say the, my understanding from the people at the mosque is that many of their congregants, if not most, are coming by foot or public transit. And uh, there's a lot of vacant space, lots and street parking in the well, neighborhood. So and, I'm just, and, and I'm just I, I commenting. appreciate that, but, um, and Mr. Montgomery, maybe you want to address this, but the if the code requirement, I think it, I thought it was um, one per five um, seats, which would be 20, um, and there's seven on site, there's still 13. I mean, is there, is there some accommodation of bike parking? I recognize that that um, you know many people would be walking, and that's typical of a lot of um, centuries-old uh, religious assembly uses in the city. But um, it, that you walk to the, the your your place of worship within the community. But um, we still have to be mindful of what the code requires, and that would give us the twenty spaces. So. If there's a way, if there's a way of accommodating that, we I think we'd like to understand how you're planning to meet that requirement. Before David starts, I would just say that there is no more space to develop parking on site. Obviously, yeah, no, no, no. Oh, so we we've got an arrangement that David will talk about that is a signed lease with the other lots to accommodate the parking. And David but, will go but, through that with you. It, and Mr. Montgomery, if you maybe you can address this. There, there is a, spe a specific special exception for offsite parking. And if you have a lease for offsite parking, would you like to um, add a request for offsite parking to the requests that are on our agenda today? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. And, and what we've put into the record is uh, a, a communication from New Zion Baptist Church, which is uh, the 1400 block of Juniata Street which we've measured as approximately 870 feet away from this site. And the pastor of that church has offered uh, on-site parking for his church for uh, any event parking or prayer service parking um, at the New Zion Baptist Church to the extent there's any, any overflow need for it. And so we'd like to mark that as exhibit there, there's five. A, there's a difference. It's not overflow need. It's the, um, the, if the parking requirement is for 20 spaces, however, that's reduced for bicycle parking. Um, it, it, is the lease going to be to accommodate the balance of parking spaces that are actually required under the code? It would. Right now we have an offer in written communication from the church offering their parking lot, we would uh, accept as a condition that the lease agreement, should this special exception be granted for offsite parking, uh, to, uh, to specify the amount of spaces and uh, its availability. That's, that's what I was leading up to. But like I said, I, I, um, to save you the, the challenge of coming back to the board for an additional special exception for offsite parking, um, I'd prefer that we consider it now with the condition that you fulfill the full requirements for that um, before a, a um, occupancy could be issued. That, uh, that's uh, all I'm uh, Madam, Madam Chairman, if, you, if I may, I, Chris uh, Richardson did a pretty thorough evaluation. There is bike, bicycle parking and bus stops within distances that do those reductions. You might like to hear that from him for your consideration. Okay, well, let's, again, regardless of what the number is, I just wanna make sure that, that we're, we're covering all bases of relief that you may need. But let's, let's move on um, to, are there other, um, specifics of the building that relate to the special exceptions that we're being asked to consider? Um, Madam Chair, I just wanted to point out the, the patio area will not have any children's playground equipment on it. Okay. It, it, it's not really uh, going to create the typical noise you might associate with a, uh, an outdoor playground. Um, and as uh, Mr. Snow, uh, who's the representative from the mosque, can address this, but we anticipate the dumpster would probably have pickups uh, once a week. Okay. It would not be heavily used. 
I will I will accept your representation of that. Um, okay. And, and we appreciate that with respect to the residential compatibility standards. Um, but is there is there other evidence that you would like to present? Like I said, the, to me the the um, the special exception for religious assembly um, has fairly limited criteria that this board is to consider, um, including the residential compatibility standards, which you have addressed. But um, we'd be happy to hear anything else that you'd like to present. Um, and then uh, we'll turn to um, anybody um, who anybody else who wants to participate. We could have uh, Mr. Snow uh, describe how the mosque congregants uh, are how we anticipate they're going to visit the site uh, okay. the mode of transportation. That would be great. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, and thank you for um, seeing us this morning. I'll ask you all to forgive my slight lisp. I, I had uh, dental surgery a couple of days ago, and I'm still uh, affected by that. We never notice. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Um, in any case, uh, so the mosque uh, is, as you may or may not know, Muslims, uh, we pray five times a day. However, most of the prayers that take place in the mosque are uh, uh, it's just a small number of people in which the the uh, the parking lot would accommodate those numbers. However, our main prayer day or or um, or our Sabbath, if you will, is on Friday, um, which makes it uh, the arrangement we have with the church is very uh, it works well because not only is it on oh, excuse me I'm I'm sorry not Saturday but Friday. Not only is it on a day when they're not using their parking lots, but it's a time of day when uh, it takes place depending on the time of the year because it's affected by uh, daylight saving times, um, usually between one and two in the afternoon um, on Friday afternoons. So typically that time of day, there's no one at the church parking lots and, uh, and very few people throughout the neighborhood, but those will be our busy times. And we're grateful for the churches for their, uh, their um, generosity in offering their parking lots and their uh, neighborliness uh, to help us accommodate the limited space on this uh, site. Well, and it's, it's, it's it's great when there are shared uses that can accommodate one another um, so that every use doesn't have to have its own parking. So we appreciate that as well. Were there okay. any um, specific questions you had for me, Madam Chair? Uh, do we have, um, Zubin, do we have others um, who would like to participate in this hearing? Yes, there is somebody calling by phone. Okay. If, um, okay. this is, if you're calling in by phone um, to the zoning hearing and want to participate with respect to 1308 Columbus Avenue or 1807 Fulton Street, could you please identify Hi. yourself for the record? Hi, yes. My, my name is Allison Keating. I live at 1435 Adams Street, which is, about, which is right around the corner from the mosque, about two blocks away. Um, I... I guess I, I wanted to clarify a few things that, that I was while listening. Um, uh, I, think, I think people misspoke a couple of times about the dumpster saying that it would be 15 feet away when they're, they're actually requesting five feet. Just want to make that clear. And the, uh, the other thing is that the, uh, the, chair, um, the chair is saying that the, um, the shared parking plan requires a special exception. And um, I just wanted to clarify that under uh, 91407 G1, um, shared parking is actually an administrator exception. Well, it's not a special I exception. was actually referring to the offsite parking, Ms. Keating. So um, shared right. parking is something that the code encourages, which is why it's allowed by administrator exception. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. offsite parking is a special exception under 914.07 G2. So. Um, okay. Do you have any um, specific 
concerns or um, <clears throat> other input that you would like to provide with respect to this project? Well, I, I, I mean, I guess I just wanted to, uh, to, to say that it's a great plan. And um, I, I guess I was, I was just a little concerned that, um, that, that the extra barrier might, um, that, that calling it a special exception instead of an administrative exception might be an issue. I wasn't sure. Um, that's that's all, the only reason why I wanted to clarify that. Um, um, but no, no, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I haven't heard anything negative about this project from anyone, um, from everyone that I've talked to in the neighborhood. Um, we all support it. Um, we don't have any issues with um, any any aspect of it. That's that's great to hear. Thank and thank you for your clarification. Uh, is there is there anybody else on the online who would like to participate in this hearing? I believe Renee Rosenstiel. Yes, Renee Rosenstiel. Renee Rosenstiel. Um, I just wanted to say that we are thrilled to have this uh, new religious um, organization come into the neighborhood. Um, um, it, Ms. Rosenstiel, could you just identify yourself for the Oh, record? sorry. Yes, um, Renee Rosenstiel, 1616 Chateau Street. Okay, and are you um, appearing as an individual or part of an organization? Individual. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're thrilled to have the mosque come in. It's increasing our diversity, which is one of the things that um, I personally value. I, I value their their right to the First Amendment speech of, um, you know, having a, a new religious organization here. Um, this is great. That's it. Fantastic. Thank, thank you much, very much for participating. Um, is there anybody else, Mr. Coleman? No, there's not. All right. Um, did the applicants have any other um, information or would you care to direct us to any other parts of your application package that we might not have considered? No, thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. We're going to close this hearing for today and we are going to end this session of the virtual zoning board adjustment for the city of Pittsburgh. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to get LaShawn back. Hello. All right, there she is. I don't have to text you. All right, uh, give me just a minute or two to remove everybody and stop the recording. Great, thank you.